Once again, there are some seats in the back. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Barnes & Noble Tribeca. Tonight, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Nikki Lee and Mike Sophia. Mickey Lee has been an influential player in the rock and roll world since the late 70s. You're reading it. Yes, I am reading it. <laughs> He's written the monthly column, My Guitar is Pregnant, for the New York Waste since 1996, created and published the Cool Me Island High Times, and has written reviews for magazines including Audio Review and Time Out New York. And uh, Lex McNeil is the co-author of Please Kill Me, the Uncensored Oral History of Punk. He's a former former editor at SPIN and editor-in-chief of NERV. So they join us this evening to discuss their book, I Slept with Joey Ramone, a family memoir. And John Holstrom, co-founder of Punk Magazine, has called the book funny, sad, shocking, surprising, and best of all, brutally honest. So won't you please join me in welcoming Nikki Lee and Mike Thank you. Testing, one, two, three. Ooh, jeez. Oh, hello. Testing. <laughs> Monitor, monitor. Wait, I'm going to move monitor. Okay. I can't see anything with my reading glasses on. So. I don't have anything to worry about because you're a big blur. We're used to having roadies for this you know, to carry our uh, books. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're going to start from the very beginning of the book. This is the prologue, and this is uh, when we, uh, when the reader first meets uh, Jeffrey Hyman, a.k.a. Joey Ramone, and we're going to start with Mickey reading, and this is the prologue, and take it, Mickey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lex, for this beautiful <laughs> okay. Here we go. It was one of those crystal clear evenings in the late winter of 1969. My mother, my brother, and I had recently moved into a new high-rise apartment building in Forest Hills, Queens, with a spectacular view of Manhattan. I was sitting in our new bedroom with Arlene, a friend who'd stopped by after our last class at Forest Hills High School. We could see the entire skyline from my bed by the window and watch the sunset over Manhattan. Arlene gazed at the city lights as I passed her the joint. All of a sudden, on the other side of the bedroom, there was a stirring beneath a huge homegrown pile of rubble. It was as if this unidentifiable mass of, of a mess had taken on an animated life of its own. What's that? Arlene asked in a hushed but urgent tone. She was ready to bolt should the inexplicable, inexplicable, inexplicable commotion continue. Oh, that's my brother. <laughs> I deadpan. <laughs> On one side of the bedroom by the window was your average teenage mess, plus a few oddities. A skinny 10-inch long mirrored hash pipe made by Mexican Indians, an eight-track tape, tape deck, an issue of the East Village Other, a copy of How to Talk Dirty and Influence People by Lenny Bruce, and some guitar picks. On the other side, my brother's side, was the pile. It had levels, or more like tiers. Clean and dirty shirts, pants, socks, and assorted underwear, a pair of brown suede, calf-high, fringe boots like the ones Ian Anderson wore on the cover of the Jethro Tull album, Stand Up, all covered by a huge Afghan shepherd's coat. Below, in another layer, were records, newspapers, rock magazines, and wrappers and boxes from various food groups, all surrounded by dishes, cups, and glasses that doubled as ashtrays, containing liquids that had created multicolored foam, beer mug type heads, that had risen up to and above the rim of the glasses. Sheets and blankets snaked their way in and out of the living sculpture. An unseen mattress lay on the floor, supporting the escalating geological wonder that was my brother's side of the room. 
Uh, are you sure that's him? Arlene asked, somewhat confused, and that I hadn't even glanced over in the direction of the mysterious mass. I don't see anybody. Yeah, that's him, I replied. Unless there's a new tenant in there that I don't know about. Arlene giggled, half genuinely, half nervously. Hearing our voices, my brother cleared through enough of the debris to pop his head up and see what was going on. His sunglasses were already on. They were rarely off. Hey, how you doing, he said to Arlene. They'd seen each other around the neighborhood. I I'm okay, Arlene said to my brother. Did we wake you up? Looking out the window and seeing that it was almost dark, my brother replied, No, no, that's okay, I was up. <laughs> As he started to clear his way out of the heap, we realized he didn't have any pants on. <laughs> Arlene said, You know, I gotta kinda get going. I told Alan I'd stop upstairs. Yeah, I said, my mom will be home soon anyway. I moved to the middle of the room to shield Arlene's view. I didn't have many girls come over after that. <laughs> My brother, the guy without the pants, lived on to become Joey Ramone with quite an amazing story. I lived on to tell it. We're going to jump now. Please don't hold your applause. Did I get my coke? Oh, um, this part is um, when they're kids and they're living Forest Hills and their parents are bringing them up upstate New York to uh, dude ranches and, and what else? That's you know, kitty theme parks. Kitty theme parks. Uh, they come all the kind of places you can't afford to you when you were uh, three, four, five years old. And I'm going to start. One time, up at Bear Mountain, a big motorcade pulled up just as we were about to enter the lodge. We were made to wait outside along the path to the entrance while a parade of police officers and men in suits escorted someone inside. It's the president, Dad yelled. Wave to him. Maybe he'll say hello to you. Jeff and I looked at each other and started jumping up and down, shouting, Hey, president, say hello. We were a little nervous. A few months earlier, we had been on the overpass above the Grand Central Parkway when a similar-looking motorcade had been passing underneath. That day, a bunch of us kids knocked some pebbles off the railing of the bridge that trickled down onto the cars below. Jeff Storch, the neighborhood bully, who frequently picked on my brother, threw a rock that made contact with one of the cars in the motorcade. Worse, some cops stationed on the overpass saw us all running away. Jeff and I were now afraid that the president was being escorted by those same cops <laughs> who might recognize us. But given that we didn't want to tell our parents about the incident, we kept waving and shouting to the president. As he came closer, we caught his attention. The president of the United States stopped for a second and summoned us past security. We thought we were in big trouble. But before we knew it, we were shaking hands with President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Ike told us we'd better be good boys and listen to our parents. <laughs> we figured the president had pardoned us. <laughs> in the summer, we would walk over to Meadow Lake to go fishing, have picnics, and take out the rowboats. Dad taught us a game called Sink the Bismarck. We'd float a can or bottle in the, in the water and throw rocks at it until it submerged. It was our favorite game, though neither one of us knew what the hell the Bismarck was. <laughs> Jeff had a penchant for catching butterflies. He even had a mounting set. He would mount his bounty on a special board with little push pins and write the name of the species in a designated space underneath. The only problem was that Jeff never followed the instructions for preservation correctly. And invariably, they would dry up and turn into bug dust about a week later. Jeff was as happy a kid as you could find in Forest Hills in the 1950s. Rolling down the grassy hills, laughing, standing up, 
spinning round and round in circles with his long gangly arms outstretched and falling over like a drunken monkey. Jeff would coax me to join him, but warn, don't throw up on me. I did. <laughs> Both of the above. We found ways to share just about everything. <laughs> Boosting each other up trees on sunny days and switching off verses of O Susanna in the basement on rainy ones. My big brother was outgoing and adventurous, cheerful and talented, and as I said before, brave. He wasn't weird, he wasn't angry or removed or troubled or sickly, or lonely or concerned. Jeff was the smiling, happy kid with the long legs, running through the thick grass, chasing butterflies, calling out to me. When I close my eyes and think of my brother, those are the first things I see. Okay, now we're going to skip ahead, and uh, this is uh, when these four outcasts named Jeff Hyman, Doug Colvin, John Cummings, and Tommy Erderly um, sort of grouped together to try to make a band. <laughs> and um, Joey had already been singing in a band called Sniper, um, which he got... Glam band. A, 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 glitter, a, glitter, a glitter band, at which he actually got asked to leave because he wasn't pretty enough. <laughs> and um, we're going to start now with Mickey. Uh, also, Charlotte, Mickey and Joey's mom, owned an art gallery called the Art Garden in Forest Hills. And um, the Ramones used to uh, rehearse. Hey, Sabrina, how are you? Um, used to rehearse there. And. Uh, um, Anyway, why don't you just start? Uh, okay, we'll look up. We'll go from there. Oops. There was a lot of water bugs in the basement. <laughs> if you ever wondered why that song, um, Hey Daddy O, I Don't Want to Go. Down to the basement. It's, uh, it's probably where they keep the water bugs. <laughs> Either it was that or it was uh, when I, my brother would go down in the basement in our house and I would lock him down there. And, no, he did it to me too, so. <laughs> Jeff was working part-time at the art gallery, and at the age of 23, he was on his own for the first time. I was starting classes at Queensboro Community College and had my own room for the first time in my life. Occasionally, I'd run into Doug, John and Doug, who were still dressing up in glam outfits when they weren't working construction jobs. John's father had gotten them. <laughs> John talked about starting a band but Doug didn't think I would be interested because I was still sporting the old blue jeans, t-shirts, and sneakers, and wasn't into the glam thing. Doug said I didn't want to be in the scene, and, and, and that I probably thought I was above them now because I, I, had, I had grown uh, tired of the obnoxious rock scene and was going to school studying classical music, jazz, and classical guitar. You're special, Mitchell, Doug mocked me. We can't play that Android Segoyevich stuff. You're very learned now. You know what I learned, Doug, I asked him? That the greatest composers in history got inspiration from the simple music of the peasants, which is today what you call rock and roll. I probably sounded like an ass when I said, everything has its value, you know? Okay, Mitchell, Doug said. You're real smart, and you can go to school, but that doesn't mean you'll make it, and it doesn't mean you're better than us. You can play your bolerios and your concertios, but you're not a star. You're just 20 years old, and still just a punk, like the rest of us. It was always hard to tell when Doug was giving you a compliment. <laughs> I still can't. <laughs> Jeff told me that Doug and Johnny talked to him about starting a band, but he wouldn't be singing, he'd be playing drums. A few weeks later, I walked into the art garden and heard something rumbling in the basement. <coughs> the door to the basement of the art garden was on the floor in the back of the gallery. When I pulled it up, the sound came rushing up out of the hole, the sound that would soon make history. At this point, it was thoroughly crude and hard to define. It was familiar, but different and new. There were some other new developments as well. 
like new names for my brother and friends. Jeff Hyman was now calling himself Joey Ramon. Doug Colvin was now Dee Dee Ramon. John Cummings was now Johnny Ramon, and later on, Tommy Early would become Tommy Ramon. Dee Dee got the name the Ramones from Paul McCartney, Tommy said. McCartney, McCartney would call himself Paul Ramon when he checked into hotels and he didn't want to be noticed. I liked it because I thought it was ridiculous. The Ramones? That's absurd. We all started calling ourselves Ramones because it was a fun thing to do. These were times where we were pretty lighthearted when we were putting this thing together. But Jeff didn't like the name Jeff, Tommy remembered. He chose Joey. I wanted to call him Sandy Ramon. <laughs> because it sounds so beach boyish. But he hated it. I thought it was a cool, funny name. Sandy Ramon. <laughs> Jeff said, hell no. We were still friends with Tommy Erdley, Johnny said. He was always telling me that me and Dee Dee should start a band. One payday, Dee Dee said, we both bought guitars and decided to start a band. Johnny bought a Mosray, and I bought a Dan Electro. But we didn't know what to do with them. We started trying to play either some Wombles or Bay City Roller songs. We absolutely couldn't do that. We didn't know how. So we just started trying to write our own stuff and put it together the best way we could. Johnny and Dee Dee started trying out drummers, but the drummers would come down and basically reject their offer even before an offer was made, saying, nah, I don't think I want to do this. They knew my brother had played drums, and though Johnny wasn't thrilled about it, he gave in. I always thought that a band with me and John and Dee Dee would be cool, Joey Ramon remembered, because we would be a good-looking band, image-wise. So one day I got a phone call and they asked me if I wanted to join a band as a drummer. I said, yeah. I might have seen Sniper, Johnny said, when Jeff was calling himself Jeff Starship. I wasn't impressed. I didn't think he was an asshole. I just thought he was a hippie and it was a little out of it. Then he played a couple songs he wrote and I said, these are okay. They were a little Alice Cooperish, but good. I was surprised he was able to do that. Me and Dee Dee hadn't been able to write a whole song yet, so he became our drummer. When they auditioned me to be their drummer, Joey related, I played them two songs I'd already written, I Don't Care, and Here Today, Gone Tomorrow. That's how I got in. Essentially, it was Joey who provided the formula for future Ramon songs with his initial contribution. The stark minimalism, the two-minute length, the maximum of three chords, the existential lyrics comprised of two lines in their entirety. <laughs> the other members of the band saw how he made it work, and the group's dynamics snowballed from there. Initially, the Ramones had no material and no concept. Had Joey not contributed, I don't care, the Ramones' sound and concept more than likely would have been something very different. I wanted to get rid of Joey as a drummer, Johnny recalled, because he wasn't keeping up as we practice. I would get better each day, and he'd stay the same. It took Joey two hours to get the drum set ready, Dee Dee said. We waited and waited for him. I couldn't take it anymore, so we started playing. We stopped after the first song, and I looked over at Joey, and he didn't have the seat on the stool. He was just sitting on the point. <laughs> After that, they asked him to sing. Actually, it was Dee Dee, because he thought I was unique in the band Sniper, Joey recalled. I wasn't like anybody else. Everybody else was doing an Iggy or a Mick Jagger. Joey was a perfect singer, Dee Dee explained. I wanted to get somebody really freaky. And Joey was really weird looking, man, which was great for the Ramones. I think it looks better to have a singer that looks all fucked up than to have one that's trying to be Mr. Sex Symbol or something. Johnny was not my idea of a singer. Uh, Joey was not my idea of a singer, Johnny said. And I kept telling Tommy that. I said, I want a good looking guy in front. Tommy convinced Johnny that Joey looked good between him and Dee Dee. It all worked visually. Was Joey a star, Johnny mused? 
I don't know. With him in the center and me and Didi on each side, that played into it. You have to be in the right surroundings. Just about everyone has to be in the right surroundings. But some people have more star appeal than others. And some people have less star appeal than others. But sometimes they shine far brighter than those with more. Thank you. Hey. I guess we get to sit down and, and talk to you guys if anybody wants to talk about anything. Or I'll ask, I'll interview Mickey again. After five years, I know everything about him. An 11 year old boy, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we'll leave out your uh, twin 10 year old Chinese girls. <laughs> Some, sometimes Legs acts like a jerk. And sometimes he's not acting. <laughs> <laughs> we are good friends, as you can tell. We, uh, we can say anything to each other. After five years of writing a book together, there's, there's no... 30 years of friendship. But there's, 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 yeah. Um, so at this point, Legs is supposed to interview me, or either that, or we can take, take questions. questions. I think we'd prefer to take questions if anyone has any, because we've talked enough to each other. I don't want to hear what any of these questions. There's a woman, yeah. What does the title of the book mean? Uh, what, I'm sorry? What does the title of the book mean? What does the, the title, title of the book mean? Who's that with Joey? Oh, no. oh, he did. Actually, I did too. But, but uh, when I slept with Joey at Arturo's, he would, he would have his legs, we were, we'd be watching TV. Um, at that time, there was two Mary Tyler Moores. And then there was, um, then, yeah, and then there was um, you know, uh, uh, the Joe Franklin show, and then there was a sign-off. So we, Joe and I were not very lucky in the early days of the punk scene, if anyone remembers that. The title of the book, actually, I, I used to write a column for a, a, a Lower East Side-based paper called The New York Waste. I think some of the, the Waste people are here. And there, 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 there's the Waste. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was called My Guitar is Pregnant. And I once wrote a column called I Slept with Joey Ramone. And the story, I, of course, I, I just had, you know, had that, that headline just to attract people's attention and say, what the hell is this all about? But the story was that when I was two or three years old, I see a scary movie like The Crawling Eye. You answer that the question. <laughs> Invaders from Mars. Which was really scary. That's really one scary. where they put the, 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 the electrodes and they, in the back of the parents' heads. Yeah, that was really and I'd say, scared the you know, shit out of me. Man. Joey, uh, Jeff, the, the monsters are under my bed. They're trying to get me. And he'd say, come and sleep with me. You'll be safe here. Yeah. That's just the, uh, I didn't that's like I the, the title. title. I wanted to call it Waiting for Joey Ramone, but I thought everyone would get too pissed off to the pretentious <laughs> reference to the Samuel Beckett Waiting for Godot. But Mickey <laughs> shot me down anyway. So. <laughs> Would you be able to clear up a rumor that's been going around all these years, like since the 70s? We, we, would we be able to clear up a rumor that's been going around? Set things right. Um, any, ru been, any rumor that's been going around since the 70s should probably stay a rumor. About Joe. <laughs> about Joe. <laughs> but, yeah, should. Um, because he was so long and slanky, they said that uh, he had Marfan syndrome. <laughs> no, that is totally not true. I know, uh, are you Carol? Yeah. yeah. Had, uh, had one of the perpetuators of this Marfan uh, syndrome. No, Jeff, my brother did not have Marfan syndrome. He just grew up really tall. And what, what's Marfan syndrome? What Abraham, Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln had it. Supposedly. The, uh, the limbs are extremely long. I, I, I've never even heard of it. Well, it's not applicable, so let's think yeah. about it. Maybe he has Marfan syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Joey did, but... We have a question from a, uh, the, the, the roadie who took over my place when I used the roadie for the Ramones. Matt, Big Matt Nadler here. The reason why I want to be sedated was written is because of this guy over there. Well, and I can tell you the story, but I won't embarrass you. Never mind that. So the story is, so after reading, writing this, after five years of you guys being together, do you guys feel like, um, like you've kind of, you've some kind of, you know, the darkest, the darkest state of either 
more happy than before you wrote it? Mickey knows how to make me calm now. <laughs> do, do you recall the line that I said about like sometimes acts like a jerk, and sometimes he's not acting? <laughs> yeah. Um, cathartic, you know, I don't know. People, man, people keep asking me that. It's just been a cathartic thing. I don't know. I mean, you know, time has passed and uh, I, I guess getting this uh, this out from my head and onto uh, paper, the paper is, is done, had some kind of effect, but I don't know if it's cathartic. I think that's more like something you, you buy on the, uh, on the, that's on the shelf of the Dwayne Reed. I, I, would, I would have to say yes, because I think Mickey was a little more, more angry when he started the book, and um, I knew that once he wrote it down and went through this whole passage, the whole story, that you know, you'd have to let go of things. And I, I, I every think emotion you can imagine. imagine. I, I, you know, you had to go through everything, you know. And I, I think it was really cathartic for, for both of us. Oh yeah, because you know? when you're reading it, I mean you can sense the love. Was it cathartic for you? Well this time you guys read it again. I mean this is the first time I'm actually hearing you guys read it out loud. You can just kind of see the love and the humor in all of it. I mean even though you didn't read that much of it, you can definitely see that there's a lot that went into it and I think it's great that at least me being someone who hasn't heard it read yet is getting a lot out of it just by listening to it. You see the humor, you see the love, you see the the pain in some ways, you know. And Arlene, of course, has a lot of great experiences waking up and seeing Joe Nico. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe four more questions. We have time for four more questions. The guy in the way back with the funny hat on. Go on, babe. Yo. <laughs> John Harris? Yeah. From Forest Hill, is that right? All right. Uh, this is, uh, just curious, I'm waiting for it, haven't read it yet. Uh, do you go into any of the, uh, like, what inspired some of the songs that Joey wrote, that the guys wrote? Does it, like, uh, maybe have, like, a short little, uh, little story behind another? Well, the KKK is, a, is an excellent example because when Joey got out of one of the nut houses, he, he actually made a lot of girlfriends when he was in St. Vincent's. And um, one of the girls he dated was black. And she drank all the liquor. The, the, your mother, your parents went away for the summer to Europe. But the main thing is that this, uh, the, the, this, this girl's parents, the parents of the, of the black girl that my brother was going out with, they did not approve of her going out with a white guy. <laughs> they didn't. They they were totally. Uh, they did not want mixed marriages. They were totally against mixing of the races and all that. So we jokingly referred to them as the KKK. Well, well, Nikki came back from that summer and said, "Where is you know this girl?" And Joey said, "The KKK took her away." <laughs> no, it's not about Johnny. And we say that this spelled that rumor in the book because not only that, but th that song was written while he was still living with Linda. Linda yeah. So obviously, yeah. Uh, it was not about Johnny taking her away. Um, but to, to answer your other question, yeah, there there are some. Uh, some some um, revelations about what song what inspired certain songs, but you know the, the, that'll be in, there'll be more information in the, uh, the, the, the book. fifteen hundred page version. Yeah, yeah. Um, this lady right here. Hi, your mom Hi. was a terrific person, and I would wouldn't say. Thank you for uh, for bringing her up. And, uh, the the book is so dedicated. Much. She to should be she should be uh, dedicated the book to her, and she would have been so happy to be here with all of you. My, my, my question to you is: if she was not the typical Forest Hill Jewish mother, <laughs> uh, how much do you think that contributed to where you and your brother and you know the life that the path that you guys went on? That made all the difference in the world. I mean, that was uh, if if not for her. Um, she was always encouraging us to express our individuality, uh, where our father was, you know, trying to push us into to being the conformist, uh, cut your hair, get a job, join the army, he wanted my brother to go into the military, that would make a man out of you, you know, and uh, um, cut your hair, but the, my mom was an artist, and thankfully she always encouraged us to express our individuality and, uh, and, and I think, you know, she helped 
not only uh, give birth to Jeff Hyman, but to Joey Ramon. Um, and you had a... Just wondering, mentioning about how Johnny is perceived in the relationship and everything, what did you guys think of the documentary, the end of the century documentary, and how that came out and how it portrayed the well, Joey? Well, I... I uh, <laughs> I mean, they, were, they were wondering how Johnny Ramone came off, how we thought Johnny Ramone came off in the documentary, The End of the Century. Or Joey, too. Or Joey, too. Well, unfortunately, Joey was gone by the time uh, they were making that. So the very first version that got shown at the, tri at the Tribeca Film Festival had I know, uh, Dave Fry, my manager here, he can verify this because he timed it. I think, Dave, there, there was 90 seconds of Joey. 19, 19 seconds of, of, of Joey Ramone represented. And so me, uh, my mom, and Dave had to fight very hard to rectify that and to make sure he was represented properly. And uh, so we worked really hard on that to make sure that uh, happened. But, but to, when we were writing the book, I kept saying to Mickey, you know, somebody had to be the you know, the drill sergeant in this band. I mean, can you imagine being in a band with Joey and Dee? I mean, I mean, you know, it's... I, I, we, we, do, we do establish that, that the value of John as sort of the, uh, you know, a lot of people refer to him as the general, you right? Know. I, I kind of refer to him as the, the f more, he was more like the foreman at a construction site. And I say so, he... Johnny finally had got Archie Bunker's dream job. <laughs> <laughs> also, also, what's what's important about the book is that Mickey was in a band with Johnny, way before the Ramones. And actually, it was Mickey who introduced Johnny to Joey. And there's this whole um, prequel um, in Forest Hills where these bands are playing. And Mickey's in them, and and you and you're doing a good job, and and then Johnny gets a little bit too psychotic, and you leave the band, and Johnny never let Mickey f f forget that for the rest of his life. John took pride in his ability to hold a grudge. So did Joe. Some people have pride in, in in their different virtues. John was proud of how long he was able to hold a grudge. I mean, <laughs> There's one, we're going to take one last question from the man in the red scarf, scarf in the back. Norbert, from another guy from Forest Hill. <laughs> um, Nick, you, you told me how horrific the editing process of the book was going. He did? And uh, I want to know how many pages were cut out, and is there going to be a sequel? Um, no, there's not going to be a sequel. I, I kind of doubt it. I mean, you know, this somebody probably a representative here from Simon and Schuster who would would be happy to verify that no, there is no no, no sequel. We'll prove them wrong. We'll prove mm -hmm. them wrong. And if, uh, if 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 my editor here, Pat Mulcahy, there she is. She, she is. is. There she is. She really uh, was tremendous in helping me. Stand up, Pat. Please. The, uh, <laughs> and I said to uh, Trish Todd at Simon, this is Mark Gompertz from Simon, who was in fourth grade with Mickey. That's how we got from that time. That's not true. Other people interested too, he told me. But I read it and I said, wow, this is really a mess, but there isn't a dull sentence in the entire book. So we worked very hard because it was all funny and just as vivid as you've heard today. And it was just a matter of making it a bit more streamlined so that it wouldn't be some phone book that nobody would buy. And thank you for making it really uh, yeah, so we, 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 blew, we blew about, uh, we blew at least five deadlines yeah. uh, in writing this book. Uh, unfortunately, Mark Alberts was, was uh, you know, had a position in Simon & Schuster where... Wasn't he at your bar mitzvah? Well, uh, was, you just blew my job. <laughs> <laughs> we blew, we blew five deadlines. But he, he let us keep going, and the, 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 the joke was, it's a good thing I invited him to my bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll hang out and sign books and do whatever you want. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you so much for coming.